Good morning, everyone. Um, glad to see everybody made it uh, up this morning. Um, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce my very good friend, Dr. Nancy Hipshin. Um, Nancy uh, is going to speak to us this morning on obstetric emergencies. Um, Nancy graduated from Mercer University Medical School. Um, she did her residency at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego. Um, and uh, She was my, my chief. <laughs> It's my great claim to fame is that I was once her chief resident. Um, she did her fellowship after that at Johns Hopkins in maternal fetal medicine. Um, she is currently the associate dean for undergraduate medical education at Johns Hopkins and also associate professor uh, in OBGYN in the MFM division. Nancy? Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for getting up so early to come uh, listen to this talk, and thanks to Joan for inviting me. And I'm so excited about this catch box, actually, because if this works out well, can you imagine, doesn't every teacher want to throw something out at their students and wake them up when they're sleeping? I'll bet you my faculty would love one of these things, so we're going to see how this works today. I'll look before I throw it out for the first time and make sure nobody has their computer open, though. Okay, so I have to make sure I can see first of all here. So the title of my talk today is OB Emergencies uh, Never Go Down Alone. And I really mean that actually. Uh, as I tell the residents and the medical students and the fellows and, and our faculty, because I'm part of the patient safety simulation and, and training group in our, in our department, that medicine is a team sport. I think there's probably two mantras the residents when they make fun of the faculty that they have for me. One is medicine is a team sport, don't do it alone. And the other is remember the fetus is an end organ. But we'll talk about the fetus as an end organ a little bit in this, in this uh, discussion as well. So I have no financial closure, uh, conflicts rather related to this presentation. Now, you know, the question is when there's an obstetric emergency, how might we react to an OB emergency? Are we going to be running around in all directions? I'm sure we've all been in a situation like that before. Um, or spectating and not knowing what it is that we should do. Or could we react in a uniform, team-like manner, recognize the acute problem, this is what we all aspire to, take a deep breath and call for help, alert our multidisciplinary team and get them rallied, know a few key algorithms and drill them. If we've drilled them, we're going to be more comfortable with these algorithms. And we always remember the mother comes first. I know we're dealing with two patients. And in these OB emergencies, whether they be an eclamptic seizure or a postpartum or a peripartum hemorrhage or a uh, cardiac arrest, remember the mother always comes first. So why is it important that we think about drilling our teams and simulating these obstetric emergencies. Well, we have two actually more national mandates. One is from the Institute of Medicine in a report in 2000 that talked about recommending that healthcare organizations uh, should establish interdisciplinary team training programs for providers to incorporate proven methods of team training as exemplified in aviation. Also, the Joint Commission, after looking at some of this data and doing a review of sentinel events across the country, particularly in obstetrics, found that the primary cause of these sentinel events was often due, more than 70% of the time, to teamwork and communication breakdowns. So by conducting team trainings in perinatal areas, we can teach our staff to work together, communicate better, better and know some of these few key algorithms. <coughs> Excuse me. So we were um, one of the early adopters in a large consortium for team training um, at Hopkins. And actually, when this started, um, I was still in the Navy at the National Naval Medical Center, which is now Walter Reed. No angst on my part for them changing the name. But <laughs> I'm sure Joan feels the same way, having been in the Navy. But that's another story. Uh, but we were part of the, I shouldn't say randomized control trial, but, but um, a cohort that did not have team training at the Naval Hospital prior to instituting the patient safety algorithms. Hopkins was instituting the patient safety protocol, and so it made it actually a pretty seamless transition, knowing that we were all working in the same consortium when I got out of the Navy and moved to Hopkins. Hopkins is part of a medical liability corporation that includes 
New York Presbyterian, Harvard, Yale, University of Rochester, and I know I'm missing a couple. Um, but what we did was we formed a patient, an obstetric patient safety group and came up with best practices largely based on literature, but keep in mind that the literature, there's not a lot of randomized controlled trials to guide us on, on this sort of thing. So there was plenty of expert um, opinion in the room at the time as well. But what we found was when we instituted team training in our, um, in our institutions, that if you look at, whoops, sorry. If you look at this area before 2002, because we instituted the team training in 2002, this is the level of the number of OB cases for which there were claims. And you can see it drastically began to drop. There were unexplainably um, a peak again here, and I think that was about 2008 and 2011. But overall, there's been a steady decline in claims in obstetrics, in, and this is for all of our institutions combined together. So at least in that respect, we have some evidence that our team training um, was working. So again, patient safety, while that was information or evidence on claims, patient safety is what we really all want at heart. And up to 40% of maternal deaths in the US have been deemed in review to be perhaps preventable. And that was um, published last year by Maine. ACOG, in the last decade, after looking at some of the evidence on team training, created a task force to combine simulation training with patient safety initiatives. In addition, BingeDot in 2007 published that the benefits of creating an environment in which medical trainees can practice without risk has led some authors to consider that medical simulation training may even be an ethical imperative. So when can we use simulation? Well, there's lots of things. You could come up with all of these, I'm sure, on your own, as initial education for our learners, but also as rehearsal for our, our long-standing teams, particularly for rare high-stakes events or catastrophic events that thankfully don't happen all that often. To provide assessment, particularly if you're trying to decide, for example, for new physicians, new nurses, if they're ready to go off orientation, for remediation, if deficits are identified, when there's new technology brought into the system, and also for ongoing teamwork training. In OB, this is perfect for obstetric emergencies, which are rare events, because medical legal climates limit the ability for hands-on learning. This allows us a safe zone to practice these rare events. And OB on L&D is really the epitome of uh, multidisciplinary teams where we have to, have to have an increased need and awareness for communication and coordination. There have also, in recent decades, been new or renewed um, emphasis on surgical procedures, for example, to manage postpartum hemorrhage, like the B. Lynch suture and the Bakri balloon, which we'll talk about a little later. So where's the evidence for this? Well, in 2011, Riley and all took a look at simulation training to determine if it was effective in decreasing perinatal morbidity and mortality. They did this study at three community hospitals. Certainly these events with hopefully a lower high risk population are going to be even more rare in these institutions. In some of the institutions they did st team steps training, in some of the institutions they did no additional training at all, and in some they combined training plus simulation. And what they found, that there was a significant decrease only in hospitals that had both team training and ongoing simulation to practice these events. And in those hospitals, they saw a decrease in perinatal m and So with that in mind, um, this morning I'm going to use three obstetric emergencies, eclampsia, postpartum hemorrhage, and maternal cardiac arrest to hopefully illustrate the algorithmic uh, approach and team approach to obstetric emergencies. So here's our first case. Hopefully none of these are anybody's nightmare here. We have a 21-year-old at 37 weeks gestation who's had no prenatal care. Nobody gets patients like that, do you? She presents in early active labor. She has recent generalized edema. Her past medical history, as best as you can glean, given she's not having prenatal care, is unremarkable. However, on admission, her blood pressures are serially 170 over 110 with 2 plus proteinuria. 
Remember, we have two patients, so the fetal heart rate tracing shows a negative contraction stress test and good long-term variability. While the IV is being placed, because you decide to admit her and draw labs, she has a grand mal seizure followed by fetal bradycardia. So again, a reminder of how we should react in an obstetric emergency. It's my turn, ready? Okay, heads up everybody. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's yours. <laughs> so, basic, very basic question. Oh, it went under. Whoever gets it first, it's yours. Oh. <laughs> that was very helpful. You can finish swallowing first and take a drink. So I want to make this low stress here. Mm -hmm. So obviously, what do we think is going on here? Eclampsia. Eclampsia. And what should our first reaction be? Um, to stabilize the mom, not freak out, get labs still, get oxygen, maintain okay. the airway. And what team members might you call in this instance, might you mobilize? Potentially anesthesia. Um, definitely, um, if the OB isn't in the room, you want to get them in there. Um, maybe just additional nursing help. Excellent. I, I agree with all of those things. And we can maybe think of some more things, but let's uh, look at this a little bit more closely. Okay, Joan, you're on for passing it around now. <laughs> she doesn't want to throw it at anyone anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to. You, got it. You, toss it to you can toss it to somebody else. <laughs> now, I'll bet you my medical students would toss this and really wing it across the room, huh? So one or two risk factors for eclampsia. Who, had the, who has the microphone back there? Thank you. <laughs> and it's important that we talk into the microphone because there are people that this is being live streamed to. So thank you. So when you're evaluating her, her proteinuria, her elevated blood pressure, she's young. Okay. Good. All of those are risk factors. Here are a few others that I'm sure you're familiar with. <coughs> Nulliparity, if she had a family history of preeclampsia, if a patient had preeclampsia in a prior pregnancy, pregnancy, not this patient, but others might, smokers, diabetes. So there's associations with all of these things um, listed here. The overall instance of eclampsia, thankfully, is only about 1 in 2,000 to 3,400 deliveries. But the risk of maternal death in the event of eclampsia is 2 to 10 percent, depending upon associated comorbidities. And the risk of perinatal mortality is up to 25 percent. Remember, these are general tonic-clonic seizures, not anything else, just general tonic-clonic seizures. The other thing to remember is that it may precipita precipitate more rapid labor. Often the hypoxic insult can stimulate an abruption, and that can stimulate more rapid labor. So when do these occur? Up to 50% might occur antepartum, up to 35% intrapartum. And while that encompasses the majority of them, 10 to anywhere from 10 to 45% may occur in the postpartum period. And quite honestly, most of the ones that I have been around for have been in the postpartum period. And it's interesting that there's no reliable predictive tests or symptoms to know who's going to seize and who's not. And at the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, every year for as long as I've been going, there's always posters trying to correlate signs and symptoms and help to predict who's going to seize and who's not going to seize. But again, not very successful at figuring out what those predictors are. And in fact, as I mentioned, the ones postpartum that I have um, taken care of have been people who had either mildly elevated blood pressures or relatively normal blood pressure. So it was otherwise often unexpected. We need to think about the maternal complications and, and evaluate these patients in a systematic fashion using our multidisciplinary colleagues, however. These patients can uh, suffer from DIC afterwards, uh, along with the signs and symptoms of severe preeclampsia. There can be maternal hemorrhage, as I mentioned, particularly if there's an abruption that ensues, acute renal failure, pulmonary edema, all these things that go along with severe preeclampsia. One interesting thing I wanted to point out, in addition to having our anesthesia colleagues, our pediatric or neonatology colleagues involved, additional nursing staff, perhaps respiratory therapy, we want to think about after we've stabilized the mother, making sure 
that we consider getting imaging, particularly if she has any neurologic deficits following. The other thing is if she has this seizure more than 48 to 72 hours postpartum, it is more likely that it might be from some other cause that imaging might help us identify, like a bleed from an AV malformation, some other bleed um, in the brain, uh, or an idiopathic seizure disorder as well. So an MRI can be very helpful. If this is an eclamptic seizure, there's nothing nice about it, but the more reassuring thing is if all you see is vasogenic edema in the posterior parietal or the occipital lobe, and I'll show you a picture of this in a minute, this is most often associated with a better prognosis when you have intracranial findings. This will most likely resolve in days to weeks along with the neurologic deficits that might exist. And this is what it looks like. In PRESS, which is reversible posterior leukoencephalopathy syndrome, you see this vasogenic edema in the occipital lobes or the posterior lateral parietal lobes in this area. But again, this, along with the neurologic deficits at the time, most often resolves. So this is a more reassuring finding than, than a frank bleed, particularly when it's symmetrical like this. So how are we going to manage this patient? As you said, we need to stabilize the patient and stabilize the seizures. So we all know magnesium sulfate is the drug of choice because of its action on the cerebral cortex. And it's very particular for eclamptic seizures. So in prevention, we often give a four or six gram bolus and then run the mag at two grams an hour. But in acute therapy, you want to give a four gram bolus at a gram per minute. So you do not want to run this in slowly. You want to make sure the patient gets a gram per minute to resolve the seizure and to prevent um, any recurrent seizures. And then you're going to run it at a maintenance dose. Now, why not use what we use for other seizures like a benzodiazepine or, or phenytoin? The randomized controlled trials, even before 2007, showed that magnesium versus phenytoin or magnesium versus diazepam, magnesium was more effective at reducing recurrent seizures um, in both cases and actually maternal mortality as well. Intrapartum, the magnesium as prophylaxis against recurrent seizures or even in severe preeclamptics before the seizure has occurred, results in a 59% reduction in eclampsia, 36% reduction in abruption, and a 46% reduction in maternal death. So these are all the catastrophic events that we're trying to, um, that we are, are trying to prevent. Keep in mind that that was a non-significant, that's why I've got the NS up there, reduction, but a trend towards reduction in maternal death. What happens if you're in triage and you don't have an IV or mother's postpartum and she's already had her IV removed? Then, I'm sure again, many of you know this, use a 50% solution of magnesium sulfate with five grams in each buttock. I've done this before. It's also a good way to see if they're responsive because it hurts like heck when you do that. <laughs> Less favorable choices if the mag is not readily available to give the five gram boluses would be the diazepam or the phenytoin. And then once you get IV access, running the magnesium. We do need to think about, I know everybody's rushing and trying to stabilize the patient and we know what the first line of therapy is, but we do need to think about some things where there might be a contraindication or a relative contraindication as we're running through these, this scenario in our head. Number one, a patient with um, myasthenia gravis. The magnesium sulfate is going to further block those um, receptor, those calcium channels and in the neurologic system and potentially cause respiratory arrest. So we don't want to go there. So that might be a patient you'd use the phenytoin or the benzodiazepine for. You want to use with caution when the patient's already getting calcium channel blockers because it may produce further hypotension. I will tell you anecdotally that we are actually using nifedipine intrapartum um, to control blood pressures a little bit more. And if mother has good renal function and she's on the magnesium sulfate, we're not really seeing this effect of the hypotension. But again, this has to be a patient you're monitoring very closely and perhaps the labetalol, the hydrolyzine that we typically use for blood pressure control wasn't working well um, for this patient. But again, has to be monitored very closely, closely and given judiciously if you're going to use a calcium channel blocker like nifedipine along with magnesium.
The other thing is concomitant use of uh, muscle relaxants can cause prolonged paralysis. So anesthesia team members have to be aware of that. The other thing is if you already have a patient who has renal failure or reduced urine output or an elevated creatinine, you can cause mag toxicity obviously a little bit further. So you need to watch those uh, respiratory effort and watch the deep tendon reflexes and perhaps decrease the rate of infusion or stop it altogether and treat only if there's seizure activity. Again, watching closely for magnesium toxicity. If you do find that you are having um, respiratory depression, calcium gluconate is the drug of choice to reverse the magnesium sulfate. Alert your anesthesia staff. Again, bring your team members together. Don't do this by yourself. Apply supplemental oxygen because you want to um, keep the, you don't want the O2 sat to fall below 95%. All right, so let's look at the algorithm for this emergency overall. Number one, call for help, and we talked about who we were going to call. We're going to call nursing staff, additional physician staff, both OB and neonatology or pediatrics. We're going to get anesthesia there, perhaps respiratory therapy as well. Um, our ABC, so things you want to think about. When you give mother oxygen, you want her to get 100% <laughs> oxygen. Mothers get hypoxic because of the physiologic changes that occur in pregnancy much more rapidly than the non-pregnant patient. You don't want them to get hypoxic because then the fetus is also getting hypoxic as well. You want to make sure that as you're stabilizing the mother, you have left lateral positioning so that you get increased return. So the circulation, the C, you want increased return to the heart so you've got um, adequate preload. And of course, two large bore IVs. Control the seizures as we've already talked about. Correct hypoxia and acidosis. The one thing you want to be careful about here is giving bicarb to correct acidosis because bicarb readily crosses the, the placenta. You can, one, worsen mothers um, already um, respiratory alkalosis that occurs in pregnancy. So there's a mild respiratory alkalosis in the third trimester of pregnancy anyway. So giving bicarb can worsen that and then um, cause uh, insult to the fetus as well. Blood pressure control, we talked a little bit about this. Typically we're going to give labetalol 20 to 40 milligrams IV or hydrolazine 5 to 10 milligrams IV as needed to control blood pressure particularly if the patient is intubated or not responsive. You don't want to be using the PO nifedipine that I mentioned before at that time. And then timely delivery. So oftentimes, many of you in this room have probably seen patients who came in near term who had a seizure who were already laboring and they progressed very rapidly in labor. Oftentimes it may be associated with the fact that there was a mild or an ongoing um, slow abruption occurring that stimulates the labor to go a little bit faster. However, if the patient is remote from delivery and the cervix is unfavorable and you can predict that this might be, might be a long induction because you're long and closed and high in your cervical exam, you want to consider after mother stabilized, well after she's stabilized and in, in, uh, proceeding with the cesarean section instead. But the seizure by itself does not contraindicate a vaginal delivery. Okay, I want to show you a little um, videotape here that was done at our institution. We have, as I mentioned, a patient safety simulation and training program. And in conjunction with ACOG, um, our department produced some of these videos to show how simulation can work for some of these rare catastrophic events. Now, they're very polished here. Let me tell you, when we get a group of people, multidisciplinary group of people, and we include peds, we include anesthesia, OB with all kinds of levels of learners in our institution as well, all the nursing staff, the OR techs, um, we'll often have the clerks who are communicating for us with the blood bank and, and radiology and everyone else. They all get involved in these team training scenarios. And it is not as smooth as you're about to see. But this is one of the more polished ones. This is triage. No? Okay. All right, I text her. So she, I think I'm always sick. Do you need a bucket? Like what? Penny? Penny? Nurse? Nurse, can I get some help? I
patient with preeclampsia, severe or otherwise, is at risk for seizure and should be monitored. We don't stop our simulations such. and get hepatitis either. Noelle, 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 one of our L and D nurses, chief okay. residents. Uh, yeah. Let's get some oxygen on her and let's get some help in the room. Can you get the postcard in here? And let's call. We need some IV access in. Um, Notice she gave directed orders in this case. Any seizure in pregnancy should prompt team mobilization, seizure precautions, airway protection, and IV access. A magnesium, a six gram bolus. Six gram bolus, I'll get it. Looks like she's okay. Can we also call for anesthesia to come in as well? Anesthesia, can we have some help in triage? Here's her six gram bolus. Magnesium should be considered for seizure prophylaxis as well as first time seizure therapy and eclampsia. A four to six gram bolus is followed by two grams per hour or two five gram doses given intramuscularly. Great. And a new set of vitals, please. Hi, I'm Nancy Yoda. What's going on? So this is Melissa. Um, she looks like um, she is having just had a eclampsic seizure. She's at 35 weeks. Blood pressures have been um, as high as the 150s over 100. Mm -hmm. We're getting a new set of vitals right now. Um, important communication with new members of the team as they arrive. And intubation as needed. Abizen, thank you very much. Melissa, can you tell me your name? With recovery from seizure, attention. Okay, a couple things I wanted to point out here also. You'll notice that the team communication techniques like call-outs, check-backs, good handoffs for the patients, these are all things that the JCA, JCO and the Institute of Medicine identified as reasons why we have poor outcomes in some of these very rare events. So moving along, our 21-year-old is now stabilized and progressing rapidly through labor. She delivers a 26 gram and 100 gram infant with precipitous second stage. Placenta rapidly follows. It's intact with a very large adherent clot. As you begin to inspect for lacerations, there is audible bleeding. That always gets your heart racing, doesn't it? So again, how could we react? Okay, who's up next with the red box? What do we think is going on here and is responsible for this hemorrhage? Well, she could have a, uh, uh, shoot, it's too early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. There's no uh, one right answer. She's an atonic uterus. Very well. She could very well have an atonic uterus because one of the risk factors is rapid labor. What should we do first? Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath <laughs> and call for additional help. Good. All right, so some of the risk factors, and I didn't throw the box here because I want to move along just a little bit here. Some of the risk factors that uh, are associated with, with hemorrhage or atonic uterus include prolonged labor, especially long augmented labor, rapid labor as we saw in, in our um, case patient here, a history of postpartum hemorrhage, preeclampsia, overdistended uterus, all of these things here. Chorioamnionitis is oftentimes overlooked, but if a patient has already been diagnosed in labor with choreo, that should trigger us to be ready. And I would advocate that when you think about these risk factors, you notice some of these are historical. We should be doing a risk assessment on every patient when they walk in the door and get admitted. And in fact, it's recommended that there are certain special order sets that we can put into place when we identify some of these risks, risks for patients so that we are ready. An ounce of prevention, I really like that adage. And when I tell patients that something might happen, whether it be shoulder dystocia or postpartum hemorrhage and go through it, my suspicion, my suspicious nature is, is that if I don't talk about it, it's gonna happen. If I talk about it, that's one way to ward it off a little bit. But preparedness is everything. And this should not just be in your own head, but this should be for the entire team. So there's a, overall, worldwide, there's a 3% incidence of postpartum hemorrhage. However, worldwide, there's at least 500,000 deaths that we know about annually due to causes related to pregnancy and childbirth, with 25% of these complications occurring in the third stage of labor. 
the risk of maternal death, whether you're in a developing country or a developed country, is unacceptably high from postpartum hemorrhage, even in the United States. So, early postpartum hemorrhage. Give me one or two things. You might want to pass the box along so the people that are remotely connected um, can hear too. Give me one or two mm -hmm. things in your differential when you think about early postpartum hemorrhage. No, take that one over to the other side. Thank you. Laceration. Somebody mentioned that. What else? Abruption. A DIC, abruption. This patient might also have been abrupting. Anything else? Touch. I was thinking acne, laceration, acne, acne. And, good. Uh, coagulopathy. Okay, so there's lots of things. So 70% of the time it's related to uterine acne. So for us to think about that over and over again is the right thing to do as you're taking care of this patient. Retained placental fragments, lacerations also rank highly up there in terms of incidence. But we also can't forget some of these more rare reasons like uterine inversion, uterine rupture, and coagulopathy because these can progress so rapidly that the patient can go into cardiovascular collapse uh, more quickly than with some of the other causes. So California um, put together a maternal quality care collaborative with several hospitals um, in California specifically to look at the poor outcomes associated with postpartum hemorrhage. And what they found where all of these reasons were contributing factors. First of all, denial that this is really a significant postpartum hemorrhage or, or uh, misinterpretation of how much bleeding had actually occurred. Delay in reacting. Again, poor estimate of blood loss. Lack of a stepwise response to the bleeding. Very, very important because we're going to talk a lot about checklists. Underutilization of non-pharmacologic interventions. Poor utilization of blood products. And here's the big one that we, if I can't say one thing too much today, it's uh, poor team communication. So they developed several interventions, and hopefully some of you are using some of these interventions in your own institutions as well. Departmental hemorrhage protocols. We also have a hemorrhage cart that's available both on the, in the labor and delivery suite and the labor and delivery ORs. Um, hospital massive transfusion protocols. I can tell you this has saved our patients on more than one occasion, including recently when uh, one of our fellows was in-house by herself and a patient was transported in massively hemorrhaging uh, from a placental abruption. If it hadn't been for that massive transfusion protocol, this patient would not have walked out of the hospital four days later. Flow sheets with algorithms. It helps if by assigning one person on the team that job. It helps make sure that we're doing everything and doing it in a timely fashion. <laughs> Nursing checklists, bless you. Whiteboards and worksheets to monitor EBL. We actually have a whiteboard in, our, uh, in each of our obstetric ORs that outlines the checklist and helps us keep track of the blood loss. Uh, instruction cards for new procedures. So if we don't know how to use a Bakri balloon or you uh, don't know how to do certain types of sutures like the B. Lynch suture, there are actually cards that can be, laminate cards that can be held up so that the, the providers can see those. Hopefully they've drilled with them ahead of time. And then certainly team drills. So you mentioned lacerations. We all know about some of the risks that are associated with lacer significant lacerations of the vagina. Forceps or vacuum delivery, that doesn't mean I advocate we shouldn't do them. Macrosomia, precipitous labor and delivery, and episiotomies. Um, but even when you routinely use operative deliveries in your uh, armamentarium, you need to make sure that you are inspecting very carefully afterwards because you can have a hidden hematoma and you don't know why mother's becoming unstable then. But these should also be considered when bleeding persists despite adequate uterine tone. But again, you need more team members in order to have adequate exposure and you need to be in the right venue. So having a low threshold to move to the OR where you can get better um, exposure and more comfort for the mother through anesthesia is imperative. Placental abruption, somebody mentioned out here. This can be plus or minus with vaginal bleeding because again, it can be concealed as illustrated in some of these pictures. This is responsible for 10% of third trimester deaths. And in medicine, obviously, that's a, a huge number. Okay, what are some of our risk factors? I won't do this to you right now. 
Joan was already over there with the, with the box. So prior abruption, there's a 15% chance if there's one prior episode, it goes up if you've had two or more episodes in previous pregnancies. Smoking, cocaine use, those of you that practice in large cities or where there's an epidemic of cocaine use, this is not uncommon to, to see these patients. Polyhydramnios, especially with acute rupture of membranes or external trauma. Sadly, in the state of Maryland where I practice, the number one cause of maternal death is not a pulmonary embolism like it is in the rest of the United States. It's intimate partner violence. So tr this is not unheard of for us. In this patient, however, it was due to complications of severe preeclampsia and eclampsia. Uh, signs and symptoms we talked about a little bit with vaginal bleeding. Again, you may not see any vaginal bleeding, but the patient may be experiencing pain um, that seems out of proportion. Fetal bradycardia, so the fetus is intolerant because it's not getting perfused well. Uterine tachycystole or tetany, elevated intrauterine pressures, and certainly maternal hypotension and shock or fetal demise. In this case, it precipitated rapid labor and was revealed with the large placental clot that was adhered, retroplacental clot that was adhered to the placenta. Retained placenta, we didn't mention this one. Again, it has a low incidence, but it may result in incomplete uh, initial uterine involution. It may also be responsible for late postpartum hemorrhage, so we need to keep that in mind. And placenta accreta, as you know, is due to invasion of the vasculature of the placenta, either in creta, uh, I'm sorry, accreta, in creta, or per creta, where the vasculature goes all the way through to the external surface of the uterus. And, and if it's anterior, it may actually cause hematuria through the bladder. So what are you going to do in this situation? Obviously, get help. That's the big thing. The first thing we should all think about, and we learned this in ACLS and BLS too, is to call for help. Establish adequate IV access, usually two large bore IVs. Call anesthesia and try to determine the etiology for your bleeding. If it's not acne, is it due to an accreta? Is it due to lacerations in the vagina? Is it due to a ruptured uterus? We need to think about all of these things. Uterine inversion can result in maternal cardiovascular collapse very quickly. So we need to think about if our patient ahead of time is at risk for this by considering some of these risk factors. Another thing we harp on with our learners and our new providers is excessive cord traction in the third stage, especially if we've got, for example, a grand multiparous patient. If we are lucky enough, this doesn't always happen, but to notice that we have incomplete inversion, that we are able to palpate or we have good visualization and are able to see that the fundus is sitting in the in the cervical os or palpate that it's in the lower uterine segment, it is relatively, I stress the word relatively easy to revert that again by placing one hand and stabilizing the uterus on the abdomen and pushing the, the um, uterus back up before the lower uterine segment, the fundus back up rather, before the lower uterine segment contracts. However, if it's more extensive and you have complete inversion, this is truly an, an emergency. You need to call for help. Again, you need your IV access and start a bolus um, because of the fact that this causes a vagal stimulus and can cause cardiovascular collapse. Withhold your uterotonics. You don't want that to be trapped in the lower uterine segment. Avoid separating the placenta so we don't want to pull on it anymore. Consider relaxation, either a bolus of mag, often tributylene or nitroglycerin are more, even more readily accessible and quicker acting. Replace the uterus, as we described already, and then remove the placenta after repositioning and the patient is stable. And then provide uterotonics to make sure that uterus uh, contracts down. Uterine rupture, again, palpation of the uterus, of the inside of the uterus under good anesthesia is very helpful in identifying uterine rupture in a patient who's had a vaginal delivery. This also can be a catastrophic event and may occur spontaneously. If this occurs spontaneously, I would advocate that you think about a patient who might have a connective tissue disorder. That's a zebra, but I'll tell you I've seen two of them in the last 15 years, and probably because we get a higher risk population in general sent to us. Um, but a first time mom having a uterine rupture should prompt further evaluation. And that obviously requires surgical intervention. So let's get to acne here really quick. The risks of acne. 
We talked about these a little bit. Infection, prolonged magnesium sulfate use, prolonged or difficult labor, grand mal to parity, multiples, polyhydramnios, anything that's going to overextend the uterus. And actually, maternal obesity is associated with acne as well. And we ha certainly have an epidemic of that in our country. The risks also include uterine <coughs> relaxing agents that we may have been using throughout the labor. So we need to think about that or in the OR for an operative delivery. So I'm a very pictorial person, and that's why I like these tables. This table takes us through the described stages of blood volume loss in a peripartum hemorrhage and illustrates how as blood volume in loss increases and you reach about 40% loss of the overall total blood volume, you can see heart rate begin to increase until you go into complete collapse with no discernible blood pressure and very rapid, sometimes even a dysrhythmia in terms of the fetal heart rate the maternal heart rate, excuse me. And again, being pictorial, I think it's also very helpful to look at this because this illustrates that at about 40% of our total blood volume loss, we have a wide disparity between the systemic vascular resistance and blood pressure and cardiac output that you think should be increasing along with that blood volume loss. But now again, you have total cardiovascular collapse and shock ensuing. The goals are to restore hemodynamic stability and renal output and just eliminate the source of, uh, and identify and eliminate that source of bleeding, judicious volume replacement. And again, this is just a slide that you can use as a reference reminder for the various types of uterotonics. One thing I want to point out and why I put mesoprostol in red. So mesoprostol probably in the last 10 years has sort of become the panacea and we call for that almost immediately and administer it rectally. You could administer it PO also for the patient in the, um, that's having a cesarean section. We've done that as well. And the thought was that in decreasing the need for additional medications to get good uterine tone, mesoprostol was in many of the early studies was more effective than methogen and oxytocin. More recent studies in larger numbers are calling that into question. So the data is still out there, but um, I would be watching for more data to come out to, to um, settle this argument on mesoprostol. <coughs> the BACRI, this is another thing that's a good idea to train and to drill because this is very effective as a tool. Initially, it was thought to be only effective or safe for using in accreta or low-lying placenta, but it's being used more and more for acne as long as we have palpated and made sure that there's uh, no rupture involved. Uterine artery ligation, stepwise fashion with O'Leary sutures down the branches of the uterine artery is very effective in decreasing pulse pressure. And again, this should be in your checklist of things to go through as you're operatively trying to decrease the bleeding. B. Lynch sutures um, as well, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. I would advocate that uterine artery embolization and hypogastric artery ligation are very special cases. First of all, uterine artery embolization. In catastrophic bleeding in the LND ORs, very few of us are going to have the ability to move this patient who's unstable or to have uterine artery ligation used in the OR. So oftentimes this is used more for ongoing, um, slow ongoing bleeding to avoid going back to the OR or going to the OR the first time. Hypogastric artery ligation, even as an MFM, it's been two decades since I've done this. So I call on my oncology colleagues and bring others into the team if I feel like we're moving in that direction. Most of us don't go mucking about in the retroperitoneum very often. So this could worsen the bleeding rather than helping if we don't know what we're doing or not familiar with it. And it may be more judicious to move directly to the hysterectomy if our our uh, B. Lynch and uterine sutures and our other techniques have not um, affected good uterine tone. This is a picture of the B. Lynch suture. It's an old technique that actually has come into favor and be, is being used much more often now. I would advocate using either a delay acromic or a delayed absorbable suture here because actually, and I have seen this when we've had to go back in on a patient, we may have gotten good hemostasis and good uterine tone to start with. If we've had to go back in to reoperate, these sutures are like loose suspenders after a day once the uterus is contracted down. That's not a bad thing, actually, because if it works, which many times it does, you don't want that uterus to be compressed for a long time. You want to avoid the long-term complications like Asherman's um, or necrosis. 
O'Leary sutures, this is what we talked about earlier, where you have ligation of uterine artery ligation. And finally, again, just to recap, with all the various causes of postpartum hemorrhage, you want to identify the risks on admission to start with and ongoing throughout the labor. Active management of the third stage. There's lots of evidence out there to suggest that that helps to decrease the incidence of postpartum hemorrhage. Mobilize help, act simultaneously, and think about what other etiologies might be coming into play or what other comorbidities the patient might have that will either help or hinder your actions. We talked about all these simultaneous actions, and with the team, you can be doing these things simultaneously. It doesn't have to happen sequentially. Definitive treatment and finally stabilizing and recovering the patient. This is an example of a nice checklist that ACOG has already provided for us uh, through the Safe Motherhood Initiative. <laughs> I encourage you all to pull this up off the ACOG website if you don't use a checklist already in your institutions. This is also a good template to use if you're designing simulations for practice. <coughs> so finally, how much time do we have, Joan? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. Well, this will be quick. Finally, we, this is a new patient, our third case. We have a 38-year-old at 39 weeks who presents to labor and delivery with a recent gush of copious fluid. She complains of chest pain in triage and is clutching her chest. She suddenly becomes dyspneic and cyanotic. This is very sudden onset. The nurse gets her vitals and she's orthostatic. She's oozing from the IV site that you're quickly placing as she's, as she's crumping. And you still have fetal heart tones by Doppler. She's moved to an L&D room. She has two large bore IVs started. And as you begin to examine her, she loses consciousness becomes pulseless, has no spontaneous respirations, and the initial fetal heart rate tracing on admission had poor vari now has poor variability and no accelerations. Again, very important to recognize the problem and call for help. So what do we think happened here? She's arrested, okay? And I heard somebody say amniotic fluid embolism. I think that's it. Great initial first thought in this case, given the details you had here. A reaction, again, is going to be to call for help. Team members, very similar to the team we've talked about already. So what are some of these causes of cardiac arrest in pregnancy? Obstetric causes. What are some obstetric causes of cardiac arrest? Anybody have the, the balls or the, the boxes near you there that you can speak into? There's one hiding over here somewhere right now. Just one, even. Pulmonary emboli, amniotic emboli. Amniotic emboli or pulmonary um, or um, thrombotic emboli. Okay. Other causes in this case, I think very likely, this was, and this came from a case of an amniotic fluid embolism. Preeclampsia, help, massive hemorrhage peripartum cardiomyopathy, anesthetic complications. We need to always remember anesthetic complications. A lot of these women may not have had a lot of prenatal care, may never have had surgery before, and so you wouldn't know if they were going to react adversely to some of the anesthetics. Non-obstetric reasons for cardiac arrest. One or two. I'm sorry? Drugs. Drugs. Okay, what else? Cardiac disease, pre-existing cardiac disease. And I don't know about you, but I'm seeing more and more women with pre-existing cardiac disease who think it's a really good idea to get pregnant and have a baby. I even have one now that I'm caring for who's had a heart transplant. I tell her every day she's going to owe me a lot of trips to the salon to get the gray covered up after she, until she has this baby. Other causes, you mentioned pulmonary embolism for um, a variety of reasons, septic shock, collagen vascular diseases. We're seeing much more of that um, now, and endocrine disorders. Thankfully, the incidence is quite low, about 1 in 30,000 pregnant women. But keep in mind some of the physiologic changes of pregnancy that are normal that we have to consider when we're resuscitating these patients. So airway edema. That can happen normally in an otherwise healthy person, so you may require a smaller endotracheal tube. 30% of the cardiac outflow is going to the uterus, so you really have to make sure you displace the uterus so you can maintain that um, preload or that return to the heart. 
cardiac output can also be increased twenty five percent just by doing that uterine displacement. very important in resuscitation and then there are other things that i mentioned off and on and respiratory is one of those things that we sometimes forget about the fact that minute ventilation normally increases in pregnancy but functional residual capacity decreases as the as the diaphragm is elevated so when you're giving respirations to the patient or bagging the patient, you may need to use a little bit less volume so that you don't blow out the lungs, kind of like what you think about in a, in a very premature infant. But you still need to maintain the respiratory rate at about 8 to 10 breaths per minute. Aspiration. You know, all of these mothers, even when they're not in extremis, are at risk for aspiration and, and um, um, reflux. So you need to make sure that you protect the airway. All right, algorithm, again, call for help. Large multidisciplinary team. And as you stabilize the patient, you may, need, may even need hematology, especially if the patient's in DIC. Oxygen in high concentrations, 100%. Fetal monitoring, if viable. But let's say we have a big bradycardic event. What are we going to do if we're in the middle of, of um, resuscitating the mother? Keep resuscitating. Right, mother comes first. Optimize that preload. Um, again, if you are giving um, something like dopamine or giving epinephrine in the, in the process of um, resuscitation, those are preferred as opposed to vasopressin because vasopressin can have, have oxytocin-like effects and cause uterine contraction. So you want to, if possible, use dopamine or use epinephrine. Consider invasive hemodynamic monitoring because it's so important to optimize that preload in these patients with amniotic fluid embolism. Lots of blood and, and uh, fresh frozen plasma because of the ensuing coagulopathy. And consider hydrocortisone in, in conjunction with the rest of your team. Think about that. Because as you know, amniotic fluid embolism is thought to be one of the theories is an anaphylactic reaction from the fetal cells in the maternal microcirculation. Your code team, very important that it always include an obstetrician to perform a cesarean delivery and pediatric support for the infant, not just your generic code team that you have in the hospital. As you go through the maternal arrest, you want to, again, think about the airway issues we talked about. Think about positive pressure ventilation, but maybe decreasing the volumes as we discussed. Chest compressions. They used to tell us to go up a little higher for a couple of reasons when you placed your hand during chest compressions to avoid the xiphoid um, causing any damage to um, either the liver or the spleen or the top of the uterus. And the other is because they thought that the heart was displaced. But imaging studies in the last few years have showed that there's no displacement vertically of the heart, maybe a little laterally, but not vertically. And so there's no need to go up higher than you normally would for placement of the hand in chest compressions. We talked about why to displace the uterus, that you can increase cardiac output by increasing preload. Defibrillation, same current you would use for any other patient. There's no alteration just because of the pregnant patient. Do take the fetal monitors off for the theoretical risk of uh, electrocuting. I think we went through most of these things already. Again, over and over, simultaneously, we should be thinking about differential diagnosis and treating any reversible causes here. Fetal assessment, so that can be done really rapidly. It's not to decide whether or not there's a bradycardic event, because there most certainly will be at some point in time, um, but to decide, is the mother greater than 20 to 22 weeks pregnant? If after four to five minutes you're not getting a positive reaction or positive resuscitation, you need to think about, in these mothers in the second half of pregnancy, evacuating that uterus, because that in and of itself can increase your return and your cardiac output by 60 to 80 percent. So again, thinking about whether to do this perimortem cesarean delivery. CPR with uterine displacement less than 24 weeks, consider the CPR because number one, you're probably not going to be able to have a viable fetus anyway. Number two, the uterus isn't big enough to really allow you to increase your cardiac output that much more. Greater than 22 to 24 weeks, evacuate the uterus for the reasons we just discussed. You may need to have cardiothoracic surgery if you have that in your institution also available to do direct massage or bypass if necessary if unsuccessful after 15 minutes.
the thing that goes in our favor in terms of doing the cesarean delivery, you think, well, gosh, I don't want to cause any more blood loss. But remember, <laughs> mother's blood is not circulating anyway. So these cesarean deliveries, perimortem cesarean, are usually associated with little or no blood loss. But it is important to pack or suture up the uterus quickly. You can always go back and do a better job. Um, because eventually, hopefully, you are going to be successful with resuscitation and circulation will resume. That team checklist is so important, maybe even more important than some of the other scenarios we've talked about. And the American Heart Association has developed this checklist for us. And you can um, find this in circulation. But even if you Google checklist for maternal arrest, American Heart Association, you'll come up with this. Also a good tool for designing your own simulations. So again, early recognition, keep cool, drill your teams for these rare events. It makes them much more confident and teaches them good communication skills to improve your outcomes and, and improve everybody's coolness in these situations. I think we'll go past this so we have time for um, questions. When you develop your simulation exercises, you want to form an interprofessional, interdepartmental planning team. Don't do this alone. You want to focus on critical events, and this is just a list of some of the events that we focused on in our institution. Postpartum hemorrhage, maternal arrest, and amniotic fluid embolus, as we illustrated today. Generate a list of critical tasks. This is all done for you in the literature. It's very easy to find these. And if you um, are having trouble finding these, please email me. I'm happy to share what we have with you. Gather your materials. You can use humans, as I illustrated in the first one. One of our patient safety nurses was the patient. Or you can use mannequins. Test your model. Make sure you have an, a valid evaluation tool to, for your team. Record them so that they can go back and debrief. The debriefing is probably the most key part of the simulation exercise. And then consider deliberate practice, where you get partway through, you know you messed up, you stop, talk about it, start back over again until you can get through the whole thing. Repeat and revise. So I would have liked to have thrown the box around a little bit, but that was a lot to cover in a short period of time. And hopefully, I've impressed upon you all, as you well know, the importance of teams in obstetric emergencies and why it's a good idea to develop these simulations and drill your team, if not because we don't have evidence yet that it improves outcomes, but it certainly improves the effectiveness, the confidence, and the knowledge of your team in dealing with these catastrophic rare events in a stepwise fashion. Thank you, and thank you for coming out so early in the morning.